Chapter Twenty One of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter Twenty One. Jane, Countess of Montfort. Thirteen Fifty. By David Hume. In the time of Edward the Third of England and Philip of France. A contest arose for the Principality of Brittany, between the Count of Montfort, the half-brother of the last Duke, and Charles of Blois, the husband of his niece. Montfort was besieged in Nantes. This event seemed to put an end to the pretensions of Montfort, but his affairs were immediately retrieved by an unexpected incident, which inspired new life and vigour into his party. Jane of Flanders, Countess of Montfort, the most extraordinary woman of the age, was roused, by the captivity of her husband, from those domestic cares to which she had hitherto limited her genius, and she courageously undertook to support the falling fortunes of her family. No sooner did she receive the fatal intelligence, than she assembled the inhabitants of Rennes, where she then resided, and, carrying her infant son in her arms, deplored to them the calamity of their sovereign. She recommended to their care the illustrious orphan, the sole male remaining of their ancient princes, who had governed them with such indulgence and lenity, and to whom they had ever professed the most zealous attachment. She declared herself willing to run all hazards with them in so just a cause, discovered the resources which still remained in the alliance of England, and entreated them to make one effort against a usurper, who, being imposed on them by the arms of France, would in return make a sacrifice to his protector of the ancient liberties of Brittany. The audience, moved by the affecting appearance, and inspirited by the noble conduct of the princess, vowed to live and die with her in defending the rights of her family. All the other fortresses in Brittany embraced the same resolution. The countess went from place to place, encouraging the garrisons, providing them with everything necessary for subsistence, and concerting the proper plans of defence. And after she had put the whole province in a good posture, she shut herself up in Henbon, where she waited with impatience the arrival of those succours which Edward had promised her. Meanwhile she sent over her son to England, that she might both put him in a place of safety, and engage the king more strongly, by such a pledge, to embrace with zeal the interests of her family. Charles of Blois, anxious to make himself master of so important a fortress as Henbon, and still more to take the Countess prisoner, sat down before it. Frequent sallies were made with success by the garrison, and the Countess herself, being the most forward in all military operations, every one was ashamed not to exert himself to the utmost in this desperate situation. One day she perceived that the besiegers, entirely occupied in an attack, had neglected a distant quarter of their camp, and she immediately sallied forth at the head of a body of two hundred cavalry, threw them into confusion, did great execution upon them, and set fire to their tents, baggage, and magazines. But when she was preparing to return, she found that she was intercepted, and that a considerable body of the enemy had thrown themselves between her and the gates. She instantly took her resolution. She ordered her men to disband, and to make the best of their way, by flight, to Brest. She met them at the appointed place of rendezvous, collected another body of five hundred horse, returned to Henbon, broke unexpectedly the enemy's camp, and was received with shouts and acclamations by the garrison, who, encouraged by the reinforcement, and by so rare an example of female valour, determined to defend themselves to the last extremity. It became necessary, however, to treat for a capitulation, and the Bishop of Lyon was already engaged for that purpose in a conference with Charles of Blois, when the Countess, who had mounted to a high tower, and was looking towards the sea with great impatience, descried some sails at a distance. She immediately exclaimed, "'Behold the suckers! The English suckers! No capitulation!' This fleet had on board a body of heavy-armed cavalry, and six thousand archers, whom Edward had prepared for the relief of Henbon, 
but who had been long detained by contrary winds. They entered the harbour under the command of Sir Walter Manny, one of the bravest captains of England, and, having inspired fresh courage into the garrison, immediately sallied forth, beat the besiegers from all their posts, and obliged them to decamp. But, notwithstanding this success, the Countess of Montfort found that her party, overpowered by numbers, was declining in every quarter, and she went over to solicit more effectual succour from the King of England. Edward granted her a considerable reinforcement, under Robert of Artois, who embarked with a fleet of forty-five ships and sailed to Brittany. He was met in his passage by the enemy. An action ensued, where the Countess behaved with her wanted valour, and charged the enemy sword in hand. But the hostile fleets, after a sharp action, were separated by a storm, and the English arrived safely in Brittany. A long and bloody war thenceforth ensued between England and France. End of chapter 21 Recording by Corrie Samuel